Let us open up with a word of prayer. Father, we pray that in this moment that you would clear any distractions in our hearts and in our mind. Father, this morning we want your spirit to teach us. Father, give us understanding. Give us wisdom. Give us a desire to please you and honor you. And today, may your spirit speak to ours. May you be honored and glorified above anything else this morning. It's in your name we pray, amen. If you are new this morning, my name is Brad, and I'm one of the pastors here at Hollywood Community Church, and we want to say welcome to each of you. And it's an honor for me to be able to have the opportunity to share a message from God's word with you. And uh, this past week, I sat back, and as I was preparing for this message, and there's, it's not just this week, there are many times in my life where I just kind of look at what is going on in the world around, and I just begin to reflect. And Friday, I decided to see what is happening in our world, and I went on to the internet to look up some news and see some headlines, and I realized that there are people that are groaning in our society and in our world. I saw that a woman this week went into an in-home daycare in New York and stabbed three infants and two adults. And I sit back and I think, people are groaning, people are hurting, this world is jacked up and messed up. And then I saw that a disgruntled employee who worked at a Rite Aid distribution center in Maryland shot and killed three people at Rite Aid. And this is all this week. Then locally, just a couple days ago, an ex-con was released from jail in July, found an assault rifle, God knows where, and begins to shoot it in Miami, and he had a police shootout, and he was shot and killed. And I look at the world, and I'm beginning to realize, like, what is the point of all this? Why are we stuck in the middle of it? Why do we have to endure this? And it's not just people are groaning. Creation itself is groaning, right? Hurricane Florence, 42 people at least have lost their lives. Creation itself is enduring the effects of sin. Not only that, somebody posted on Instagram recently a picture of like these uh, plastic grocery bags sinking through the ocean. And it says, sea turtles don't know the difference between this and real food. And the sea turtles are getting caught in these plastic bags and they're dying. And it's not just people that groan, it's creation is suffering, that's creation is groaning, waiting for when is it going to make it right. And then for me personally, I'm groaning because every day there is a battle going on in my heart and my mind. The battle is I know I've been saved, I know my purpose in Christ has been restored, but there is this sinful nature that always wants to rear its ugly head, especially when somebody draw, cuts in front of me in traffic. <laughs> I envision blowing them up every time it happens. And I know that's not godly. I know that's not the right response. But there are things where I realize that even myself, why am I having to have this battle every day? I'm sure many of you will agree with this statement that the Christian life is hard work. Amen? You all feel that way too? You see, and I sit back and I wonder, God, I think my plan would have been awesome for you to do. Here's the plan. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. You're delivered from this world right into the presence of the Lord. Wouldn't that be a seamless transition? Do away with all the foolishness of this earth. Do away with all the suffering and the pain and just be ushered straight into God's, Woo! I put my faith in Christ, now I'm in heaven. Wow, look at all of this. That's not what God does, does he? Have you ever asked those questions? Why do we have to endure the pain and suffering? Why can't you just return now? Why do we have to wait for your kingdom to come fully? And I know you guys wrestle with these questions because you're human. You sit back and you wonder, why, why is there this delay 
and what God is doing? And when will he return? Because I know for many of you, some of you might sit back, and it looks like in your marriages you have more for worse than for better. And you're sitting there going, ah, I just wish, God, you would return. Maybe your job is giving you more work, but they're giving you less pay. And you're sitting there going, God, why don't you just come back? Why don't you just return? Or you've been working tirelessly to pay all of your bills, and it's still not enough because you're running around crazy, and then you got family to deal with, and you got responsibilities elsewhere, and you're just tired and saying, God, enough is enough. I just want you to return. Why haven't you come? Or maybe there's someone you personally or someone you know has been battling a disease, and there's no end in sight, and it's like, Jesus, why can't you just, just come back, and all this suffering will be done, and I'll never have to endure it again. And then because you guys are human like me, you wrestle with, this, with, with temptations, you wrestle with sin, and we wonder, when will the victory come, and why must I endure? So this morning, we're going to look at a few questions. Why is it necessary that I live in the now? God, why can't you just make everything better now so I don't have to wait for you to make it right later? Why can't Jesus return right now and make my life easier? Amen? And this morning, these are the questions that we're going to unpack and we're going to see that we are not the only ones that have struggled with living in the now and later. You see, each of us, we are living in a gap period. Jesus' first coming, he came. He became king. He ruled over his creation through his death, burial, and resurrection. His kingdom was ushered in. Lives were beginning to change. He began to reign in the world. His disciples began to reign underneath his authority, taking his message of the good news, taking his life that he was living, and continued that mission. But then he went to, the, to heaven to be with the Father and said he would return just like he left. And now we're all waiting in this gap. What's the purpose of the gap? Is the purpose of the gap just to see how long we can suffer? No. Is the purpose of the gap because God's just too busy doing other things? No. Is the purpose of the gap to show God's mercy to get as many people saved as will be saved? Sure, that's part of it, but it's not the whole reason. You see, there's another reason that applies to us personally, and I put it in your notes this way. It is this. If we endure with him... We will what? Reign with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. And the Apostle Paul, he makes a powerful statement in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. And he says it this way. If we endure, we will also reign with him. And if we deny him, he also will deny us. What is Paul saying here? In other words, if we are willing to endure the hard things of life now, we will be able to reign with Christ later. And the word endure has the idea of this, is that it is being willing to do the hard things now, which means putting in all the hard work and effort, giving everything you have with doing everything with your hands and with your mind to serve Christ to love Christ, but it's also working as hard as we can to love our neighbor as ourself. And so there's all kinds of sufferings and trials that we will endure, but it means doing these hard things. And he knew that each of us need encouragement in your Christian life. Do you all need encouragement to continue? Yes. I've never met a Christian that said, I have arrived and I don't need anybody to encourage me to live for God. I just rightfully do it. That's why I don't even go to church. I sit at home at my couch every single Sunday and I am fulfilling the law of God and I am doing exactly what God wants me to do because I'm sitting at home doing absolutely nothing and I have arrived. And <laughs> You see, God has called his people to endure in this life. And God's people, we need encouragement. We need to hear Paul tell us, look, don't give up. 
Keep working hard because remember to keep your eye on the prize. Don't look at what you're sacrificing now. Keep in mind of what you're building into for the future because if you endure, if you stay strong, if you resist temptation, if you resist sin, if you stay with it, you will reign with Christ. I'm reigning. I want you guys to understand that the goal is not just getting to heaven and sitting on a cloud in a diaper with a harp. <laughs> that is not the end game for God. God has established purpose from the beginning of Scripture. And that purpose will be carried out now in the present and it will be carried out later in the future when his kingdom is fully established. And he tells us if we endure with him, we will reign with him. And where does Paul get this idea from of reigning? All the way back in Genesis, this whole series, we've looked at the different, uh, the different commandments that God has given to people. In Genesis 1, he had created his people, us, mankind, for a specific purpose, and that was we were to bear his image in the world. We were to show people what God looked like. We were to serve and rule over his creation, being good stewards of his creation, building cities, building villages, building towns, showing people this is what the love of God looks like, being the good stewards over it, and then telling people, man, there is a good God in heaven who loves you and would love to be your God as well. We were to be a kingdom of kings and priests. Priests telling people, man, our father is awesome. There's one God and it's him and he's over here. You would get to know him. You would see the love he has for you. You would see the blessings he has for you. And you can become the people of God who will bear his image in the world. But very quickly, we see Adam and Eve blew it, just like we all have. All of us have blown it. We've given into sin. We've given into idols. And instead of reflecting God's image to the world, we reflected death to the world. And everybody that we're telling them is, look, it's just death. It's just sin. It's just mistakes. It's just pain. It's just suffering. And instead of us reflecting God's image and reflecting praise and glory back, we just became like everybody else and reflected death to death. Yet everybody who puts their faith in Jesus Christ has their image and their purpose restored. And when you are restored, catch this, your purpose is restored as well. And your purpose is what it was in Genesis, what I just mentioned. You are to bear his image in the world. You are to be a king. Reflecting that, being a good steward over God's creation. This is why this past series we talked about making sure all areas of your life you're allowing God to rule. Self, job, community, church, whatever it is, every area of your life. Give it over to God. See it as God's work so that you can reign in his work that he has given to you. And secondly, it is loving our neighbors so that they will bring praise and glory to our Father. This is the purpose that God has restored to each and every single one of us. And Peter even picks it up as well. He says this in 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen race, talking about those who put their faith in Christ, a what? A royal priesthood. And who are royal? Kings. Priesthood. We all are priests. We are kings and we are priests. Why is that? We're a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why is that? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, I think we spend too little time on the idea that we are actually kings now. We think future, that, oh, yeah, in the future, I'll be a king. No, no, no. Peter just tells us, you are a royal priesthood. You are a king now. We are operating with Jesus' authority to push back the darkness in our world. Okay? But for many of us, we think the goal is heaven, 
And the gap is just me sitting back and just telling people that you're going to hell. And if you believe in Jesus, then you'll get into heaven. And now I've done my job and I can sit back and go home and think I've lived out the gospel 100%. No, no, no. That's not it. That's part of it. Forgiveness of sins is part of it. But you living out for God in every area of your life, in your family, at your workplace, when you're at Starbucks, when you're at Burger King, wherever you find yourself, it is being a king and realizing we are called to push back the darkness. You see, we are part of a kingdom that is un. Shakeable. From the moment this movement began, where Jesus raised from the dead and his disciples carried out the work, the rest of the world said, we're going to squash it out. Tortured, beat, put in prison, killed them. There are still Christians persecuting today. But what is happening in our world? Is God's kingdom broken? No, there's a reason why the Bible is like one of the number one selling books of all time. Because it is moving and changing and lives are being turned around. Lives are being restored. We are part of an unshakable kingdom where God has called us to be his kings and to reign. The scriptures say that even the gates of hell will not prevail against this kingdom. And so when we realize our purpose, yes, give God a hand. You see, God is calling us to remember our purpose as kings, that he has given us authority now to live for him and to make an impact in our worlds, no matter how old you are, no matter what job you do, understanding that everything you do is for God's kingdom. And some people will say, well, Brad, I am just an electrician. No, in Christ, you are a king who does electrical work. Now, is it important? Yes, we need electricity. You wouldn't hear me that well if we didn't have it. So yes, this all helps. But understand, you are a king first. Being a king is your identity, not by what you do. And it's taking the purpose that God has given you. It's taking those gifts and talents and saying, okay, you're an electrician. What you do matters. But remember, your other purpose is being a priest and getting people to reflect praise and glory back to our Father. John says it this way in John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness, and here's the beauty of it, and the darkness has not overcome it. You might say, Brad, how does being a king help me now? Well, if you have your Bible, turn to Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to dive into these first four verses. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, Paul says this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What is Paul saying here? Paul wants to change our perspective. He wants us to stop focusing on all the physical things of this earth and all the worries and all the trouble and all the things that we endure. And he wants us to think about God's spiritual kingdom that is alive and well and moving and is changing lives. What matters to God should matter to us. We shouldn't wait for society to tell us what to do. We shouldn't wait for the government to tell us what to do. We need to be about God's business now. And what God was about was about being a light to those in darkness who are blind, who are deaf, whose hearts are cold and standoffish to the things of God. And he is calling us to continue the mission that Jesus began And here's what Jesus told his disciples, that that mission that I began, all the ministry I did when I lived here, you will do greater things than I did. Can you believe that? Like, think of everything Jesus did, all the miracles, the best preacher of all time. And he told his disciples, under my authority, you will do greater things 
than me. So reigning as kings matters now. You see, we have to learn how to be citizens of the kingdom. I mentioned it a few moments ago that many of us, we won't just automatically, once we put our life in Christ, we just won't automatically be the citizen that God has called us to be. If we literally sit back and do nothing, we will not develop the character necessary to be citizens of the kingdom. We have to learn how to be citizens of the kingdom. There is a new way to live. There is this old self that has to die even though it wants to rear its ugly head, blah, 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 we have to put it down so that we can be the kingdom people that God desires us to be. You see, the point of the gap in Jesus' coming is it is a preparation for us to build the character necessary to rule in God's kingdom. So I'll say it another way. In the waiting now for Jesus to finally return, it is our time to prepare our hearts, our lives, and our character. Because the character we develop now will be the character that we will use to reign in the future. You with me? You see, the work you do now matters because you're developing that character necessary. Look at Colossians 3, 5 through 10. Paul says this, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath is God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Why is that? Seeing that you have put off the what? The old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. How many of you have read this passage before? All you? Okay. How many of you have seen other lists like these sins, especially in Paul's letter? You can find them all over the place, okay? And there's a reason for that. But here's what happens. There's a tendency when we look at these lists, we see, okay, put to death all these things, and a lot of people have just kind of reduced Christianity to just do this and don't do that. And then what we've done with Christianity is we said Christianity is just a bunch of rules that you have to follow. And if you're a person that's out there in the world, how many of, how many of you naturally love to follow laws? You see cookies when you're a kid and your mom's like, don't eat the cookies. Well, now I want to eat that cookie. If you wouldn't have said it, I wouldn't have wanted to do it. But now you told me not to eat the cookie. Now I want to eat the cookie. I wasn't even thinking about cookies. I was just going to go in there and not brush my teeth, but you said not cookies, and I'm going to eat the cookie. <laughs> and this is what happens. All of us, we naturally rebel against rules. And so is, this, is Paul telling us just to give us a list of here, do this and, and don't do that and go do it, chop, chop. It's not what he's doing. What he's doing is he's pointing out saying, okay, guys, look. I mean, he says it in verse 7. In these you two once walked. It says this old way of living, this earthly way of living, is not the character you need to reign as my kings. Think about it. If you are sexually immoral, immoral you have evil desires, you're angry all the time, you have wrath, malice, and slander. How effective are you going to be in telling people the good news? People are going to be scared of you. They're going to look at your message and go, you're a murderer. I want nothing to do with you and your God. All you do is lie. Like, I don't understand. If that's what Christianity is, I don't want it. So what Paul is telling us is, look, you guys used to be this way. In another passage, he says, but you were washed, you were cleansed, you were sanctified, you're justified, you're glorified, and now develop the character that represents the kingdom of God. These other things, that's not the character we want. That doesn't show people what God's love looks like. That just shows people what they already look like. It's showing death to death. To show people that there's a different way of living takes new characteristics. And it takes effort and hard work combined with the Spirit to make it 
happen. Every time that we resist our flesh through the Spirit, and every time we deny ourselves and resist that temptation, we are building character now that will last later in the future when Jesus fully returns. Jesus even picked up on this new way of living, right? Remember the whole Sermon on the Mount? You can go back and read it, chapters, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And he says crazy things. If somebody punches you on your face, turn the other side and let them punch that one. Come again? That's not how I naturally would respond. I want to fight back. I want to defend myself. I have to defend my pride. Jesus says, no. If somebody takes your jacket, give them your shirt also. What? Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for them. Well, that just doesn't make any sense. It does when you understand that's what God's kingdom looks like. That's what his character looks like. You see, each of us, we're all hostile to God. We all had times where we shook our fist at God. I want nothing to do with you. You can't control my life. You aren't allowed in my life. I don't even believe in you. This is what the Bible says all of us are born into. Yet God, through his grace and love, sent Jesus Christ to take our sin, our shame, and our guilt, and through his death, burial, and resurrection, has broken the powers of our idolatry to where we could put our faith in him and say, yes, God, I'm sorry. Have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I now see you. I believe in you. You see, that's the character of God. And he wants us to demonstrate the same thing to this lost and hurting world. His kingdom has begun. Us, his people, must live in a new way. We must show the characteristics that will show the world that there is a God who loves them and cares about them and can restore their purpose and give them hope. And this is why we can't give up. Paul says in Galatians 6, 9, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not what? Do not give up. And yes, I'm not sitting here saying to live these characteristics and to develop it that it's easy. No. But this gap period is purposeful because if we endure the hard things now, we will reign with him later. That a character we develop now sticks and it will allow us to reign with those characteristics when his kingdom is fully here. Look at Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Just a quick question before I read the rest of it. Does the world, thinks, does the world think these characteristics is what makes us successful? Not at all. The world says, do what you got to do to run people over so you could be the best. You got to focus on your pride. You want to be the best, you got to put everybody else to shame. And so these characteristics are different. But these are what matter. And look what he says. Bearing with one another means understanding that we all mess up. That some, sometime a Christian is going to hurt your feelings. And that's not the time for you to say, get out of my life, I cut you off. It's bearing with one another, realizing we're all still making mistakes. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And then verse 14, and above all these put on what? Love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. You want to know what the character of God looks like? Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with each other, forgiving each other, and then you could even get into the fruits of the Spirit. 
These are the characteristics that God wants us to develop. But the greatest of these is what? It's love. See, love is what will bind everything up. It encompasses everything that God does. And love is what will last into the future. There's a quote that I'll read to you that says this, love is not our duty, it is our destiny. Love is a language spoken in God's new creation. And so your work matters now. And this whole week, Pastor Bri- this whole month, Pastor Brian's been sharing with you that your work matters. Why? So that you can live out the love that God has for you, but also has for those that are in your life so that they can see that there is a good God in this world, so that you can help push back the darkness where in your workplace, in your marriages, in your communities, in your schools. And when you love as God has loved us, people will see it and they will want to give glory to our Father in heaven. Now you might sit back and say, Brad, how do I develop these characteristics if they don't happen automatically? It's by training our minds. Look back at verse 2 of Colossians 3. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your what? Minds on things above. It all starts with our minds. But I want to give you some encouragement because you might say, Brad, my mind's messed up. Don't worry, mine's too. My earthly brain's jacked up. It's not wired properly. But here's what we have. Philippians 2, 5 says, have this mind among yours, yourselves, which is what? Yours in Christ Jesus. Every one of us who has placed our faith in Jesus Christ has the mind of Christ. You have the answer to developing the character that God wants for you. But we have to learn how to train it Develop it, allow God to work in our hearts and in our mind. You see, yes, the Spirit will justify us and sanctify us and glorify us automatically. But there is a human effort that we have to put in to these characteristics as well. And some people might say, Brad, it's just all about grace. I'm not saying your salvation is won by works. Don't misunderstand me. It's all by grace. It's grace and faith alone. That's it. That gets you saved. But there is a responsibility that God calls us to do in our efforts to develop the character where us working in cooperation with the Spirit's power are developing the character necessary. And you might say, well, Brad, are you sure about that? Well, let's look at what Paul says. And since he was inspired by the Word of God, he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I did what? I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. You see, to develop these characteristics, it takes our effort in combination with the Spirit. We have to be willing to endure the hard things. Yeah, telling our selfish selves no is hard. Putting ourselves down every single day is difficult, but the reward is worth it. If we keep our mind on the prize, on what we will receive, it will help us endure the present moments. You see, Paul encourages us to run our race, to not give up. He says, don't grow weary in doing good, don't give up. But then he tells us, race to win. Race to win what? To win a crown that is imperishable, that we will have forevermore for all of eternity. If we're willing to endure with him now, we will reign with him later. You see, each day we have to consistently make thousands of right decisions to develop this character. And if we consistently set out, we will be ready when the time comes to put those characteristics into action. There's a story of a bishop. He was at a church service and there was thousands of people 
at this church service. And in the middle of the service, probably about 15, 20 minutes after the service started, there was a protest that came in, yelling and screaming in the middle of the service. And all the thousands of people are sitting back going, what? And yelling and screaming, fathers for justice, fathers for justice, screaming all these things. Can you imagine that happening here? All of us would sit back and, what is happening? Should I call somebody? Should, no one did anything. But then this person said, after just a minute or so, this one person got up, one of the leaders of the event, walked over to the main guy yelling and screaming, spit coming out of his mouth, ah! walks over to him, whispers something in his ear, had a little conversation with him, walked over to somebody else that was a leader at the church, whispered something to them. That person walked up to the front and said, the leader of the protest is going to be given four minutes to tell us what this is all about, and then they're going to quietly leave. Guy shared for four minutes, got done, quietly left. And the guy who was witnessing all of this was sitting back going, how did this little old man quiet everything with a whisper? And then he remembered that for the last 20 years, as this guy would make his way from his house to the church, that he would stop along the streets and talk to every rough person that the rest of the world ignored. He went to the people that everyone was scared of, he met them in their pain, and he listened. And as he consistently built and developed that character, when the time came for him to put it into action, he was ready because he prepared. You see, in the same way, these characteristics, it's not going to happen because you tried one day. It's constantly making these little thousands of decisions and consistently working through the Spirit's power that you would develop the character necessary to reign. I'm going to put a quote on the screen for you. It says, when your character is fully formed, you will not think of your character you will think of God's love for you, and then you can love your neighbor. See, many of us, we don't want to love our neighbors because we're so concerned about ourselves, we haven't developed the character necessary to be concerned. But if all of us determined we are going to build kingdom character and realize how much God loves me, then we will want to love our neighbor and realize that our work matters now. If we endure with him, we will reign with him. And so you might sit back and say, Brad, what do I do today? Like literally, what do I do when I go home today? It's what I, this is what I have to do, and all of us in Christ, we all have to do this. I'm gonna use an illustration for you, okay? I'm gonna take my jacket off. Don't worry, that's the only thing I'm taking off. I don't want you. <laughs> and I have two jackets here, okay? One jacket I like, the other jacket I hate. But this jacket, it's old and it's worn and it's torn. And this jacket, it's, it fits easily. There's a lot of movement in it. I feel free in it, right? It's worn out. And every day I have a decision in my spiritual life. Do I want to put on the old me that's comfortable, that I know? Do I want to put on the new and each day when you get out of bed, you have a choice. Which me am I putting on? Old me or the new me? Because if we're honest, the old me, I hate the old me. I hate the old clothes. Because I know all the pain that it brought into my life. I know that when I was pouring into these old clothes and I was living out these old clothes, I know all I cared about was myself. But when I decide, man, I'm going to put on the new clothes. I'm going to do things. It's, it's tighter than the other one. I can't even get my arm in it. But I'm going to put on these new clothes. It's a little snug. Sorry about that. But I'm going to put on these clothes because I like the effect of what it's doing in my life. Because it's preparing me 
It's equipping me to be a king now so that I can reign later. And so each day you got to make hundreds of choices. Am I putting on the new clothes or the old clothes? New clothes or old clothes? And I love it if God would just block out that one portion, but he's not because it's preparing us. We're building that character. If you didn't struggle, you wouldn't build character. Right? Difficult times <laughs> prepares us. It preps us. It refines us. It takes away what shouldn't be there. And so you might say, Brad, can you be even more basic with me? What can I literally do tomorrow morning? Here's what I would say. Wake up every morning and pray. God, today, I'm putting on your clothes. I'm putting on your character. Help me to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Strengthen my spirit and help me make the wise choices. And help me to love others as you have loved me. So this week I challenge you, every day you wake up, make that your prayer, that you would develop his character and not your own. And imagine if all of us would develop this kingdom character. Can you imagine the darkness we would be able to push back in the city of Hollywood? Can you imagine the strongholds that would break in people's lives? Can you imagine the people whose souls would be saved and would be put right with God again? Imagine this even further. Imagine the city of Hollywood becoming a lighthouse to those walking in darkness. Imagine this city becoming a place where saying, what is happening in Hollywood? People live differently. I don't know what's happening, but they don't respond like everybody else. You see, if we become the people of light and live as the people of light, people will give glory to our Father who is in heaven. See, all of this is possible if you understand that your work matters now and later. And you live out your role in all areas of your life, self, family, job, church, and community. If we endure with him, we will reign with him. Bow your heads with me this morning. Father God, you know our struggle to be the people of God. Father, you know how easy it is for us to become distracted, where we put our mind on things of the earth. We don't think about the things above where you are seated at the right hand of the Father. Father, I pray that each of us would understand our role as kings, that we would understand that we have the mind of Christ that allows us to develop the character necessary to rule in your kingdom. And Father, I pray that you would give us the heart and the strength and the ability and the power to make the right decisions that will build your character in our lives. And Father, the greatest of these characteristics we desperately need to be evident in our lives, which is love. Teach us to love like you. Give us compassionate hearts just like you to see the lost as people who are stuck in their sin, stuck in their idolatry, but there's a God and a Savior who loves them. Father, do in our hearts what only you can do. It's in your name we pray. Amen.